You're locked into Inception Radio Network, Superior, Wisconsin. You're tuned in to Night Vision Radio, exposing the truth one secret at a time. Prepare yourself as we explore the shadow worlds of suppressed history, secret knowledge, forbidden religion, and shine a light on the conspiracies to keep it all from us. Vision Radio. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We have an exciting show planned for this evening. I'm really, really grateful to my good friend, Patricia Baker, who connected me with my guest tonight and suggested him. And my goodness, as I was telling him on the phone prior to us going on air, I've been steadily delving into his material, his life story, and it is quite, quite amazing. Now, I don't know how many of you might have seen uh, the HBO documentary that was released this week called Going Clear about the Scientology, Church of Scientology. Um, I know if you didn't see it, you definitely heard about it because it was all over the news and there's been a lot of reviews on it uh, since that time. And so I thought it might be interesting and timely to sort of look into uh, organizations like that, and I'm not talking about necessarily in, in uh, similar philosophy, or but just how these organizations work, uh, how you get involved in them, and uh, actually a marvelous story and a very revelatory story about this gentleman's 15-year journey into an organization called the Process Church of the Final Judgment. I have with me tonight artist, musician, and author, Timothy Wiley. Timothy, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me, Renee. It's a real pleasure. Well, as I promised um, in some of the uh, promotions that I posted online today, we're going to be talking today about everything from cults to NDEs to angels. So we've got quite a lot of material to cover, but in reviewing your research, uh, I see that, you know, this is certainly nothing that you can't handle. You've got a lot of experience in all these areas and have done some thorough research. So I'm sure we can learn a lot from your uh, experiences. Now, can you talk a little bit? The Process Church was originally founded by uh, a couple named Robert Moore and Marianne McLean, who later uh, changed the last name to Grimston or DeGrimston. Uh, because of its occult sort of connotations, I guess. Now, could you talk about what the occult connotations of that? I mean, when I see the word Grimston, I, I think of grimoire. Is that am I on the right track? Uh, I think more, more of a coincidence than anything. Um, Marianne had um, pretensions, I think you'd call it, to being. Uh, you know, an important person, and I think uh, she wanted to probably change Robert's name or their name because they were married to uh, to, to Grimston because it sounded more authoritative, authoritative and and uh, and special. I don't think it was so much uh, for the occult aspect mm. of it, although I hadn't thought about it until you mentioned it. You might be right. <laughs> well, you know, I had just read that somewhere, and so I started trying to figure it out myself, and I thought Grimston, well, oh, maybe Grimoire, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, but maybe that wasn't it at all. Maybe, as you said, it sounded a bit more uh, authoritative and possibly a little bit more aristocratic. Yeah. Um, but now you um, were sort of involved with this organization almost, you know, in the very early days, right? And you now this was after... 
uh, Robert and Marianne left the Church of Scientology. They were declared suppressive persons by L. Ron Hubbard himself uh, because probably they disagreed with some philosophy or another of his. They split off, and they did use some um, forms of... Uh, of, of therapy uh, or some methods of Scientology. However, they developed their very own uh, philosophy that differed very greatly from Scientology. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, the background really is that um, I uh, I was at architectural um, school uh, with Robert, um, and the architectural training in England is quite a long one. It's a seven-year training. Um, and Robert did three years um and then after the three years, we have one year out working in an office, and then you go back to school again for the, uh, for the fifth, sixth, and seventh years. Um, and Robert left after the third year, and I actually lost contact with him. He was one of my best friends at that point. Um, I'm a little older than I was, and he'd done his uh, national service, and uh, he was you know, somewhat more sort of mature than the rest of us in the architectural in, the, in that particular year. Um, so he was an impressive person, very intelligent, very bright, very well read. Um, we got on very well. But he disappeared uh, from my life anyway. And when I came back, I think in the, in like the fifth or the sixth year, he recontacted me out of the blue. He divorced his, his wife and had remarried this new woman, Marianne, and had just um, was considering starting this, uh, this psychotherapy. Um, and they asked me if I would be a guinea pig, um, which I <laughs> cavalierly kind of, uh, said, yes, of course. Um, Adventurous so spirit you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I made uh, a little... Did we really? ...one of the psychology institutes. So I was kind of used to um, the whole business of kind of answering questions and you know, being a guinea pig in that situation. So I kind of willingly said yes. Now, the reason they left Scientology, and they were only there for about a year, I think, uh, is that they really saw that Scientology um, was taking everybody in the wrong direction, by which I mean they were using the technology basically to create little Ron Hubbards. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, somebody, I think, said that on that uh, show that you were talking about on Monday. Um, that part of that process was turning people into little Ron Hubbards. Uh, so they spotted it pretty early, and they realized that e-meter, that little lie detector machine that Hubbard was using, could be used much, much more intelligently and much more um, creatively, uh, and not trying to create, you know, um, little Marianne's or little Robins, but actually trying to find out more about ourselves, which we did. So it really started as a psychotherapy. Of course, the more you dig into yourself, the more you ask questions like, why are you here? You know, why am I here? You know, what's my function here? What am I really here to do? Um, spiritual things start coming up, you know, not necessarily religious things, but spiritual answers, you know. Um, and so, you know, basically we gradually turn from psychotherapy into, a, into more of a spiritual, uh, um, almost like a sort of a mystery school, I guess you'd call it. And then when we came to America some years later, we um, uh, we became a religion more for tax benefit, <laughs> tax reasons than any other any other reason. Uh, we continue to be a sort of psychotherapy and a, a, a spiritual therapy, I think you say, all the way through. Yeah. So more than than what we might call a mystery school, it was actually more of a therapy. Although, wasn't it sort of uh, billed as a mystery school at one time? I don't think anybody ever billed it as a mystery school. I think it's something, a, a term I used in one of my books, um, because it seemed to me to be closer to a mystery school than to anything else. Um, I mean, a mystery school is also a psychotherapy, because essentially, I mean, if one wants to sort of clarify uh, one's consciousness, it's more, it's more a question of getting rid of stuff, getting rid of our... Um, the, the delusions that we have, the lies we tell ourselves, uh, you know, that we're not capable of doing this or, or we're not brave or we're not clever or whatever it is. It's more a question of getting rid of those things um, in, any, in any sort of uh, study of um, you know, the spiritual world. So, well, I uh, must say that I, in reading some of the material, uh, certainly s some of it makes 
very good sense. Uh, obviously, the people involved were highly intelligent. Um, and I could see how other people, you know, people say, how do you get involved with these groups and how do you get sucked in? Uh, I think, and, and it, it, it seems that people think, oh, I'm, I'm too smart to get involved with something like that. But really, it's kind of the opposite, isn't it? It's if you're really, really intelligent, then you're going to be exploring these kinds of ideas. And some of them are very, very good. And it's if you can sort of take what you can use and leave the rest, you're okay. But uh, a lot of it made, made a lot of sense to me. And I'm not, um, I know some of it was controversial. And uh, I think there's certain sort of... Um, buzzwords that, or, or words that are sort of emotionally charged uh, for people in general, just because of our upbringing, society, our programming, words like Satan and Lucifer and things like that, when they come up, it's just sort of a, uh, a deal breaker uh, for some people. But there really was sort of, in some ways, uh, some historical basis for these kinds of beliefs. And some of the uh, earlier Gnostic type beliefs and in, in that sort of thing. It, at least that was what I took from it as I was looking into the material. Is is that fair to say? No, that, yes, that, that, that's very that's very correct. Um, and I think, you know, to point to the uh, Gnostics would be a, a very good pointer um, because we, you see, we really didn't get into the whole sort of business of religion um, from a, a belief point of view, we got into it from um, a, a behavioral point of view. We started realizing there were different types of people, and the typology was very similar to um, the kind of, for instance, the Jehovian type we saw as being, uh, you know, very authoritative, very controlling, um, you know, with a dark side and a light side, you know, that they tend to be great leaders, but they also tend to be quite egocentric. You know, then you get the Luciferian type, who tends to be more artistic, um, more interested in uh, um, creating um, beautiful effects on people, um, the dark side being that they can slip into self-indulgence. You know, the Christian type... Uh, wants to bring everybody together and in peace and love and charity and everything like that. The satanic type um, is very fiery um, and uh, often, you know, takes public roles. Of, I'm so sorry, my cat is on my lap and is. <laughs> You've got the cat problem. I have the dog problem, so <laughs> so we're in good shape. <laughs> Uh, they, I don't think dogs scratch as much as cats do. No, <laughs> no. But they have other, they have other feelings. Um, so anyway, yes, just to finish off that little cycle, the satanic type is often the fiery type, the leader type, often the very rebellious type. Um, so that's the way we came into it. And then when we started, um, you know, having to sort of uh, decay the terms of our religion, you know, in order to get that tax exemption, um, you know, we kind of uh, made it much more specific and much more clarified. Uh, and then, you know, it became, um, you know, something to do with the four gods. Now, I, I never worshipped I don't think any of us worshipped these gods. It wasn't about worship Satan or worshipping uh, Jehovah. It was about understanding them, understanding the nature of these archetypes. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely it does. Now, you said, you know, obviously you already knew um, one of the founders. You knew Robert before he, the, the Process Church was ever founded, before he even ever met uh, Mary Ann. So, and then they started using you as a guinea pig to try out this therapy that they were developing. How did that go from the evolving into the uh, the church itself. I mean, I know you just explained uh, in some way how those theories and and evolved, but how did it then become an organization? Is it was it because of the tax exempt status and uh, which allowed you to operate? 
Yeah, and that was down the, just down the road sort of because we started becoming in, 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 aware in, of the philosophy. Uh, I, I, I think we were talking at the same time. I missed what you what you asked. Have we no, lost my guest? I think I'm here. Am I here? Hello. Hello. Well, we're talking with Timothy Wiley, author of Love, Sex, Death, and he, about the Process Church. It seems that he's dropped out of the line. We'll see if we can't get... Hello? Hello. There Hello. we go. Oh, was that you that dropped out, or was that me? I'm st- <laughs> I, I can't tell. I know I do drop out every once in a while, um, oh. only for a short time. But uh, Oh, sorry you. about that. <laughs> Um, yes, I think you're asking about how, how this becomes an organization. Well, what happens is I was basically the first one who was a guinea pig. And because I was the architectural school and because I'm the kind of person who tends to gather people around him, you know, almost um, unconsciously in a way, you know, uh, a lot of my friends started joining um, and, um, you know, going into the therapy and everything. And that's really how it started. Um, I, I left, actually, after about six or seven months. I had a terrible row with Marianne, and I said I'd had enough, and I left. And I left for two years. Um, and when I came back, of course, it was all organized, and, and they were in Wigmore Street, and they had oh, 40 or 50 people coming every two days you know, for therapy. And it was a going concern. So I, I miss, missed a lot of that early stage. Um, I'm glad to say, actually. Uh, now, this was this was in the '60s and the '70s, and it you know sort of uh, probably your involvement in these kinds of matters came, you know, sort of in the post-war era. I would imagine when people were becoming a little bit disillusioned and and starting to look uh, for different ways of of being. Was that sort of a sign of the times? I think so, yes. No, I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I can't speak for America, but in England, you see, in the, in the early 60s or the late 50s and early 60s, because this really basically started about 1963, 1964, we were all absolutely convinced that there was going to be a, a, an atomic war. I mean, you know, we just come out of one war. We, we knew what wars were like. We knew what bombs did. I grew up with bombs dropping on my head. Um, so, you know, we had no delusions about it. We knew that, you know, it wasn't worth getting getting under a, 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 you know, a table uh, for protection, under a desk for protection. You know, bombs blew everything up. So, uh, you know, it was a very, very difficult time. Um, also, we were covering from the war, you know. We kind of had the delusion that we won the war, but of course we hadn't really won the war. And you know, England was in a terrible state. I mean, not as bad as Germany, but in a terrible state. So, yes, there was all that going on. And also, you know, being young people, you know, in our sort of, you know, 20s, um, you know, we were looking at authority that had got us into two world wars within 25 years. You know, I thought, hell, there has to be a better way than this, you know. So, really, I think what drew us all together. And probably what drew a lot of people to small groups like ours was let's try and find out a better way of being together, you know. And of course, once you get into that, you find there's an awful lot of uh, problems uh, that we have both internally that prevents us from getting on with people. Uh, so we better take care of ourselves before we start trying to save the world. And I think that's really about basic sort of stance. Make friends with ourselves. Make friends with all the sort of the the negative aspects of ourselves, so we can release those things. Um, you know, before we start trying to help other people. Now, I, I know a lot of times in organizations, whether they be uh, you know a research organization or whether they be a religious organization, uh, a lot of times we'll start out with sort of one you know mission statement or raison that, and it, it it's. It, it, it does have a lot of uh, good aspects to it or positive aspects. But then it seems when people start organizing that sometimes a, a hierarchy will develop and there becomes to be problems with egos. Did that happen uh, in the organization, the Process Church? Did it start out one thing and then sort of 
expanded into something else with egos uh, going out of control. Or, it, For instance, I heard that um, while Robert wrote the books and, and, and did a lot of the talking, that Marianne was actually the real powerhouse behind the group. Is, that, is, yeah, is there any true. truth to that? Oh, yes. No, absolutely true. No, she was, uh, it was really a matriarchy. Uh, but she um, decided to sort of stay behind the scenes. Uh, you know, the uh, kind of be the invisible sort of uh, power behind the throne. The trouble is, Robert ne- never really sort of cut the cut the biscuit. He never really, uh, you know, made it as a, a plausible messiah. Uh, he wasn't that good a talker. He was a good thinker, but he wasn't that great a talker. Mm-hmm. But you, you know, your point about organizations changing, yes, of course, I think organizations do change, and, and especially, um, you know, small groups like that. Uh, where you get a number of people interacting very intensely together. And yes, hierarchies em- do emerge because some people are smarter than other people, some people do some things better than other people. And, you know, when you're trying to organize a you know, situation, you tend to put the people who do the best things, in, you, know, in, you know, in relevant positions. Uh, so you're bound to get hierarchies. I think we've kind of, um, we have a sort of, a really negative understanding of hierarchies because the hierarchies we know are sort of so badly balanced and and the authorities often you know don't uh, you know aren't, aren't don't don't uh, have our respect but if you can imagine a situation you know where everybody basically is functioning as optimal everybody's in the position that they, they function best at then that's a hierarchy but it's an effective hierarchy and everybody I can't hear you. I hope you can. See. Oh, there you go. I can hear you again. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, uh, listeners, for the technical problems that we're having. Um, so, did um, what was it that that made Marianne the special one? Was I mean? It seems to me that uh, people were encouraged to sort of look to her as a goddess, and that that's what Robert saw her as. No, I no. I, Nobody encouraged anybody to uh, think of her as a goddess by any means. Mm. Uh, in fact, she was never talked about in those terms. But she was an extraordinary woman. I mean, she was absolutely brilliant. Um, I think anybody, anybody uh, however did, much they disliked her, and I disliked her intensely for the first couple of years, mm. um, would have to admit that she was incredibly brilliant. She was psychic. She was... She had one of those natural psychic intelligences that could just read somebody. And I, you know, I, I remember taking a very, very uh, uh, strange architect. We were doing some building work together to meet her, uh, which was quite rare. She very rarely met people from the other side. He was not a believer. He, you know, within 20 minutes, he was, he, you know, she had him eating out of her hand. She was absolutely brilliant. Um, very persuasive. Yes, not so much persuasive, but just naturally, just naturally, um, just naturally brilliant. Gosh, it's so hard to describe, isn't it? Because it, it's quite rare. People like that are quite rare. But they just, they just completely hold one's attention, um, mainly because they know so much about you. You know, this is this is really where they're so brilliant because they can dig underneath the surface and tell you things about yourself and talk to you on that level that draws the best of you out. It's a wonderful quality, but a very difficult one to uh, to keep keep going with. I think. Now, uh, obviously, you did take some positive things and there were some positive experiences and it was it seemed like a tremendous learning experience but what happened in the end why did you leave did uh i think you left in 1977 did you have an advisor of um of people going into these groups if they feel like it because what it does it allows one to express and experience a whole series of different emotions, of different uh, different activities that one would never experience under normal conditions. You know, it pushes one to the very limit. It's really much like people go to war to find out who they are. You know, uh, I think spiritual people, you know, turn to these small groups in order to find out who they are. 
And yes, it was a very, very rich experience, but I think she had to be out of it. Would you do it again? If you, if you went, could go back in time? I, 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 I can't see a situation where I would ever need to do it again, no. No, No, but I mean, if, if you could live your life over again, do you feel that largely it was a positive experience and that you learned a lot? I mean, uh, I heard you say, I think on another broadcast, that uh, struggling, it, it can be good that we need the struggle to realize the joy and that a lot of times when we suffer pain, we realize later that we've received sort of gifts from that. I know, you know, for instance, uh, you know, I lost my daughter uh, 10 years ago and it's the most horrible, painful experience that uh, I can imagine one could have. But I do realize over time that I have been given gifts. I believe that I'm actually a better person from having suffered that pain. I'm a much more empathetic person. I'm a much more understanding person. I sort of look at people now and, you know, maybe someone's not acting in a way that I appreciate. And I say to myself, well, I don't know what's going on in their life. You know, they, I don't know what struggles that they're going on, that they have going on internally. So, uh, certainly, a bad experience can be a learning experience nonetheless. But do you see it in those terms, or do you see it as largely positive? It, it, it would be too simplistic, I think, for me to say that it was largely positive or largely negative. It was, it was a, a bit of everything, but the main thing was that it took everything to an extreme. I mean, there was a situation, for instance, when we were... Uh, in uh, in Mexico, um, and there was a hurricane coming towards us, and we were living on the seashore, um, and we were warned to leave and everything, and we said, no, we, we'd been shown this place by our guides, and we were going to stay. And so we did, and, and uh, you know, the, the hurricane came, and um, we did our circle, and we talked to our, our guides, and uh, we asked the hurricane to, to miss us, and um, it, uh, I wouldn't say it missed us, but it didn't completely blow us away. You're still here. <laughs> I'm still here, yeah. But it's so fascinating. You can now see, you know, if you pull up one of the maps on Google or something, you can see it coming straight for, and then you could dump it into it. And right to the last moment, it just turns off and goes down the coast and blows away Santa Cruz. You know, and I think it killed over almost 300 people down there. Oh you know, so situations like that are really facing, um, you know, essentially facing death in a way, and and coming through it and coming out the other side of it, and and, and realizing, okay, you know, I saw how I reacted in that, and I learned a lot about <laughs> about the, you know the uh, impulse towards death, for instance, um, which I didn't know I had, but uh, it came out. So. It was, you know, situations like that were tremendously insightful. That's the point I'm making. Great. Well, you know, I know that during your stay uh, with the organization or during your time with the organization, um, you had an, a near-death experience. And I would really love it if you would get into that uh, during the second uh, half hour. We're going to take a break here in just a few seconds and would love to hear about that and your um, subsequent research into near-death experiences and into, into the afterlife. You are listening to Night Vision Radio. My guest is Timothy Wiley. He's a musician, artist, and author, and we're talking about cults, NDEs, and angels. Stay with us, please. Everyone, Lori and 
Fenton here, host of the California MUFON radio show, asking if you'd like special access to exclusive and amazing information about UFOs, the paranormal, and all things unexplained. If you're nodding yes, then join IRN's Insider Club. As an Insider Club member, you'll get an all-access pass to premier Inception Radio Network content for only $4.99 a month. This includes live UFO and paranormal conferences, live streaming UFO sky watches, exclusive IRN radio and TV productions, and of course, paying radio with MJ and Ken Storch. So don't wait any longer. Visit InceptionRadioNetwork.com and click on Member Login to join IRN's Insider Club and get your VIP access today. Are you a fan of Inception Radio Network? Do you reckon it's the best alternative talk radio station on the planet? Well, if you do, head to facebook.com forward slash Inception Radio Network and like the page. Tell your friends, spread the word, and keep listening to the best. Do you have a smartphone? If so, Inception Radio Network is the best app for you. Available on iTunes, Android, Samsung, and most other app stores. Just search Inception Radio Network. With the app, you can listen live, check out podcasts of recent and past shows, view our videos, see what shows are coming up, who the guests are, and, via the chat room, send live questions to those guests. You know it makes sense. Check your app store now. Inception Radio Network. I'll see you there. Hey, IRN listeners, make sure you tune in to Night Vision Radio with Renee Barnett. Renee will be exposing the truth one secret at a time. When? Thursdays. Every Thursday, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. Pacific. Where? Right here on IRN. You're locked into Inception Radio Network, Superior, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us on Night Vision Radio. If you're just tuning in, my guest tonight is author Timothy Willie. Wiley, sorry, I am your your host, Renee Barnett. We've been talking about Timothy's book, Love, Sex, Fear, Death, the Inside Story of the Process Church of the Final Judgment, detailing his 15 years with the organization. And uh, I know, uh, Timothy, while you were there, you had a near-death experience. You actually died. I did. And can you tell us a little bit about that experience and, and, and what that was like? Well, yes. I mean, I had this in 1973, and this was, I think, two years before the first book came out about near-death experiences. So I, I had no idea what it was. Um, it was a, well, let me try and describe it. Well, firstly, I had... Um, I basically worked myself to death. I was in charge of an organization, basically, that had to make enormous amounts of money. Uh, and uh, it was an incredible struggle to keep up. And I, I had been existing on about two hours sleep for, for, I think, probably two or three years by that time. And my lungs had given out. Uh, I fainted in my office. Uh, and I kind of dragged myself back uh, to my house. And I drew a bath because I'm a kind of water person, and whenever I'm feeling bad, I, I generally draw a bath and, and meditate. So anyway, I got in the bath, and within about, I would say within about two minutes or so, I just lay there with my eyes closed. Next thing I knew, I was I was being hoisted up out of my body, you know, up, 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 and I could see down, I could see the earth getting a big valley opened up underneath me, and and I guess I was about 500 feet in the air, and, and this monorail car came zooming up, up the valley. And next thing I knew, I was inside the monorail car, and there was about eight or ten of us in the monorail car. There was a, 
um, black man, obviously playing the trumpet absolutely beautifully, and I kind of knew in those moments we were all we were all dying. This was <laughs> this was a little group who were dying at the same time. It's kind of almost funny. Um, it was a <laughs> lovely feeling. Anyway, within a couple of moments, um, one end of the monorail car sort of. Uh, they came diffused in a sense, and I, I could just see sort of figure uh, of light at that end. And I heard in my mind, I said, yes, you're right. The voice said, you are dying, um, but we want you to know that you've completed what you came to do, and you can continue if you want, or you could return to your life. And it was told to me that there was no attitude. It, was that. it wasn't, you know, you should do this or you should do that. It was just, you know, you know do what you want. <laughs> anyway, I thought about it for a couple of moments, and I realized that this is so wonderful that if I went on, it was just going to go on getting more wonderful. But if I came back, I just didn't know what would happen. So it's kind of my curiosity which threw me back. But anyway, I said, okay, I'll go back. And the monorail car kind of dissolved, and the next thing I thought was just bank upon bank upon bank of angels, and they were playing music, and oh, it's like the music of the spheres is just absolutely beautiful. Uh, I, I I I heard uh, or I saw that you described it as boogieing angels. I love that term. <laughs> they were boogieing. <laughs> Oh, and, uh, yes. Uh, there was a, a painter, I think, or uh, an artist working in the, in the 19th century who, who got that sort of bank of angels pretty much right. Anyway, next thing I knew, I was, um, I was standing uh, over an enormous plain, and there were mountains in the distance, and in the middle of the plain, there was this kind of building that looked alive. It was all moving, but it was definitely a building. And I became aware of two figures either side of me. I couldn't see them, but they were kind of figures of light. I could see them by the corner of my eye. I was drawn across that plane into the building. I was put onto a sort of a, a slab, almost like an operating table. I lay there for a few moments, and there were little, little guys sort of skittering all around me. And then um, I could see a sort of a, a machine sort of came up over me, and then a female, female came up behind me, and a voice in my mind said, this is going to really hurt, but it's only going to sh uh, last a very short time. And this thing came down into my tummy, and it went into my, and it really, really hurt, but it was only for a very short time, thank God. Anyway, I got up, I was taken out, and then I was taken to a place that I was told I would never remember, and I haven't remembered it, except when I rem read uh, another person's book who said he had a somewhat similar experience, and he was taken to heaven. And yes, that, that's, what, that's what it was. I was shown heaven. It wasn't now, I, the heaven. I, it was, I it read wasn't the heaven. It was, you know, just a local heaven. Anyway, and then I, oh, I, I was slept back into my body. Choo, 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 choo about 20 minutes, and the bath was lukewarm, so I had been out for about 15 or 20 minutes. And I got out of my bath, I was healed, I was absolutely healthy, and I was a different man, I was a changed man. Now, now, you do hear that uh, people with near-death experiences have done some research into that myself and worked with the IONS uh, organization, the Association for Near-Death Experiencers, and... Um, you hear that story a lot. Uh, most people, and I also read your article on your website that you wrote about near-death experiences where you talked about people's experiences are sort of tailor-made for them, that there are some common elements that most people do have, but um, people's think, experiences seem to be, to be according to their own sort of belief system or according to need. Yes, yes. Um, the, I think exactly that, according to need. I think the the revelation is how individualized it all is, you know, because I think um, almost everybody who comes back who um, is told to come back or gets the feeling they have to come back. Uh, but it's, one of the, the strange things is that uh, it seems that everybody does have a particular function. Everybody has something that they need to express and they need to do in, in, over the course of their lives. I mean, when I was told I had completed what I came to do, the implication was that there was something to do. And I think that that's what we all struggle with, you know, especially in the age that we're living in, you know, which is so materialistic, you know, 
True. I don't think we're here necessarily, you know, just to get a job. Um, I think Make a lot of money. <laughs> for profound reasons, yes, exactly. Yes. That's right. Now, you know, and in, in, in if you're talking about, you know, people's experiences being according to need, occasionally we do hear about someone having a hellish experience. You said, you know, you went to heaven, but we do hear about these hellish, horrifying experiences. Uh, what what do you have to say about those? Um, the ones that I've studied are almost invariably transitional. In other words, people go through hell and then they come out the other side. It's sort of like that saying of Nietzsche, if you find yourself in hell, keep going. <laughs> um, yes. And they kind of break through to the other side. Um, uh, I've come across a few that, that don't do that. But of course, um, yeah, I mean, there are heaven and hell realms. Um, people who misbehave badly on this, you know, here, don't have such a great time on the next, uh, the next plane, you know. I mean, it's all about learning. And if people don't realize that we have to treat people the way we like to be treated ourselves, then <laughs> they mm. find them in a, themselves in a position where they are treated in a way that they have treated people badly, if you know what I mean. It's I all see. about learning. It's not about, you know, go to hell for all eternity. It's not punitive. It's about learning. Yes. You know? Well, you do hear uh, most people that I have heard that have had these negative experiences, they were life-changing. Oh, and yeah. they ca they came back and they made some some uh, amazing adjustments exactly. in their lives and the way that they lived. And, and, and as you said, the way they treated others is the main thing. Yeah. So I guess in some ways that, according to you, that's what they needed to get the message. That was their message. And that was the way they were able to receive it, possibly. Oh, yes. No, absolutely true. I mean, um, I think you made the point earlier about, um, you know, uh, your very sad situation of, of losing your, your child uh, and how, you know, after a while, you know, so much came out of that. You know, so much information, so much strength and so much newness came out of that. Um, and I think this is true for all of us. Uh, you know, we come up as babies, we're totally egotistical, we think it's all about us, you know, and gradually we have to move out of that frame, you know, until we see that, you know, we're all brothers and sisters and, you know, we like to be treated the way we treat other people, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, so, you know, it is uh, uh, quite a harsh learning in some cases, but, of course, we're eternal beings. Um, it isn't just this one lifetime and that's it. <laughs> it would be awful if it was. Uh, we continue, you know, we continue to learn. It's a long trail. Um, do you mind if I throw you a question from the chat room? No, please. Uh, Cruzy has asked, when you had your near-death experience, did you see spirits, and if so, were the spirits in human form or animal mystical creatures? Besides the angels that you saw, were you in touch with any other beings? No. I did I, no. Um, the beings, well, the people you saw the people on the on the monorail, of course. Yes, yes, but they, they they were not. I mean, they were. My best understanding of that is they were like me. They were dying at the same time, and they were going to continue on. I think that voice that told me I was, uh, you know, I come to do what I done. I done what I came to do was addressed to me. I don't think it was addressed to the other people in the um, in the uh, car. Uh, and no, I didn't see any spirits. Um, the you little didn't. guys who were kind of who were healing me, um, kind of, kind of, I guess, might have been kind of little greys of some sort. You know, that's immediately what I thought of when yeah. you were describing that experience. That uh, you were taken into this building and you experienced a healing and there were all these little beings scurrying around you working on you that's when you had the really painful albeit brief experience and immediately i thought of uh the countless accounts of people who have claimed to have et experiences and being you know in a surgical situation with these little guys around i immediately thought of the grays how do you uh perceive that or explain that if you do 
it, it's a very strange um, concatenation of these of these two these two kind of strains. You know, the angelic on the one hand and the extraterrestrial on the other. Um, I think it's because we really don't understand uh, the nature of the, di- the dimensions. You know, physics is kind of struggling with the idea of dimensions, but you know, even in, in string theory and things like that, the dimensions are tiny and they're not really really relevant. But actually, if one visualizes things more sort of like an onion, you know, uh, with the dimensions getting finer and finer as you go outwards, I think the, the, the dimension next to ours, if you like, which is inhabited, you know, by, um, by another small angelic group or midway, midway creatures or djinn, um, and um, extraterrestrials have to come into that frame, into that phase, in order to appear in a third dimension. Let's call that the fourth dimension. They have to go through that. And I think what the experience I had was within the fourth, fourth dimension, where there were angels and there were extraterrestrials. I think that's probably what, uh, what happened. And are you aware of an extraterrestrial presence here? Oh yes, of course, yes, yes, and absolutely. Yes. You have I mean, had well, experiences, I, I understand, with visitations. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yes, I, I, I've had one or two. Um, yes, I mean we are part of a cosmic family, you know, whether we know it or not. Uh, but because this planet has been isolated for such a long time, for almost two hundred thousand years, you know, we've been rather off the sort of the galactic. Uh, tracks, you know, although we have, we have been visited um, over, the, over the millennia. But uh, over the last sort of 50 years or so, yeah, you know, things are, things are really hotting up, and I think you know, we're going to be part of the rejoin the galactic community, put it like that, I would say within, within our lifetime, certainly. Yeah. And you, you see that as a positive? Oh, yes, very much so. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's our heritage, you see. We were never meant to be isolated. I mean, we're like a child who who's locked in a small room, you know, and then expected to kind of take care of itself. I mean, on a normal planet, extraterrestrials come and go. You know, everybody knows about angels. People, you know, work on their guidance and everything. But we're in this strange position of being isolated along with another 36 planets, but that's not here or there right now. We're isolated, and we've had to make way for ourselves. We have to discover how to live for ourselves. Uh, and we've emerged, of course, very strong, um, rather rebellious, but very much admired by the rest of the, uh, the rest of the universe. Don't we? Very much admired. And what do you see uh, happening once this sort of reunion takes place? Um. <laughs> I don't like to speculate too much uh, uh, on that um, because I know whatever I speculate, uh, God's going to come up with something a lot funny and a lot, a lot. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> there's no point in it. Um, I, what I'd love to see is I'd love to see us, you know, rejoining the galactic community, you know, being part of a much larger frame, and being able to, you know, go to universities on other planets, uh, invite other people here. Um, that's what I'd love to see. And why do you think we are isolated and have been isolated? We were isolated because the angels who take care of this little segment of the universe uh, got stroppy and um, basically rebelled against the uh, the overall administration of, of, of planets and angelic planes. And um, as a consequence, the system of planets... Um, was isolated, and the 37 planets who uh, identified with the rebellion were, uh, you know, were given given particular treatment. <laughs> and we are probably the most, uh, I wouldn't say difficult, because I think there are three, three of the 37 planets which are even more difficult than ours, um, but we're certainly the most challenging, put it that way, the most challenging of planets. And is that because we haven't yet evolved enough? I mean, I know in comparison to other planets, other galaxies, we are a very, very young planet and a well, young yes. galaxy. Yes, yes. I mean, yes, we are We are young. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I would say most... 
I mean, there are, there, are a, there are a lot of extraterrestrials who are incredibly interested in this planet right now. I mean, I've, I've had reports of, you know, well over a hundred from different, different sources, you know. Um, this is the place to be. This is where the big show is. Do you have any insights into whether or not we were a race that was created uh, or intervened with by extraterrestrials? In the in the Thatcher uh, um, understanding, sure. Um, n- no, um, uh, no, we weren't. Certainly, weren't created. We've been very heavily influenced, um, which is which is different, of course, because you know we still have the basic thing inside us. You know, we're all we're all indwelt by the God. You know, uh, and uh, whatever overlays are placed on that. Uh, there's no getting away from it. Um, yeah, it's been a long, hard trip, and I think we're just coming out of the out of the fog. And it's difficult because as we're coming, you know, as we're coming into this new frame, all the old stuff that's been piling up and hasn't been dealt with for the last two hundred thousand years is coming out basically in all these sort of corruption things, feeling really like the boils on the body. You know, it's it's a, a, extruding out of the. Uh, the world mind, if you like, um, which is why we're seeing all these uh, apparent upsets. But they're you know, teasing problems more than anything. The worst is over. Hmm. Um, another question from the chat room, Cruzy again. Why well, Cruzy's on a roll tonight? <laughs> what type of system do you think the angels are run by? I.e., government, communism, utopian, or like a tier-like system? Angels are created for their specific jobs. They don't have the same level of choices that we do. They're very good at what they do, but they're not awfully good at doing things that they're not meant to be doing, which is probably why they went into the rebellion in the first place. Um, So I don't think we could really classify it as uh, any of what we know as sort of uh, uh, social systems. Um, I think it's more along the lines that everybody does what they do best, and everything sits in. I mean, I can kind of visualize that, because I know from my days in the process, even though there were maybe 30 or 40 of us in certain periods, we were all doing what we would, what we loved to do and what we did best. And it produces a sort of a harmony. Um, that allows everything to happen in a very easygoing, very humorous, a very loving way. Uh, I think that's where we're, where we're aiming towards. I think everybody knows that in their hearts. And this is the way we treat our children, for heaven's sake, isn't it? Yes. Should, should do. Um, I heard you on another uh, broadcast. The, the host had asked you about uh, the idea of calling on our angels for, for help. And you said, oh, I don't think that's a very good idea. Could you explain that? Do you recall that? Asked, yes. You, know, uh, you ask um, deep questions. Uh, I, I have to take a moment to, to think about them. Um, yes, this is a complex thing. You see, Angels aren't here to make our lives easy. They're here to help us come to terms with what we need to look at, what we need to understand in order to learn. Right? So angels will quite often guide us into situations which we might not choose consciously because they are uncomfortable, but we learn from them. And that's what the angels are interested in. They're interested in producing situations in our lives in which we can grow and learn and and develop in spirit you know, become kind and good at people now i have heard people um reliable people that i know who've had an angel experience and it seems that although they weren't really calling out for an angel that an angel did appear at a time of great emotional grief or upset and they came as a very comforting uh, experience to the person yeah. that was suffering. Yeah. So they weren't actually, you know, trying to direct the angel, but the angel did appear. Uh, have you heard of those kind of experiences or had that kind of experience? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Um, I mean, I think in, I mean, 
it's hard to really explain how much we're loved, you know, because we don't really love ourselves very much. So it's hard to really imagine how much an angel loves us. And, um, yes, of course they're concerned, uh, you know, when we are under terrible situations. I remember an extraordinary... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I was on a, tra- a chat show uh, down south one time, and a phone call came in from a guy, an elderly guy, who was a tugboat uh, commander. And he told the story about dragging a, um, I can't remember what it was, I think it was something to do with oil, um, but it was a floating platform, and he was dragging it, and there was a storm, and there was about 25 people in the floating platform. The storm got so bad that he had to cut the line, otherwise the floating platform would have pulled his little boat down with it. But the audio was still working, right? And he said he, he, he was in tears when he told me this on the phone, right? Or, you know, on the radio. Um, and he said, first I could hear them screaming, and then the screaming stopped, and then there was a, an awestruck starting of, oh, my, oh, my God, my God. And the, people say, they're angels, the angels are all around us. But how the angels are all around us? And he was crying. I mean, this was a hard guy, you know? And he'd been totally changed and riveted by the story. Mm. And I think that happens a lot. I mean, I'm sure in this plane that went down, I'm sure in the, at some point, in those last microseconds, angels were there with those poor people in that plane. Mm. I'm not sure of it. Even if they were still in their bodies. Um, I mean, there's quite good evidence that people leave their bodies uh, well before uh, a plane hits the ground under those situations. Yes. Their bodies are the screaming, it's not them. Their rest of their bodies. Yes, let's hope. Let's hope. I I remember a a story that was in the news here in the United States uh, several years ago. It was here in California, in Northern California, I believe, where uh, a couple of people burst into a a school. Uh, It was a preschool or anyway, very, very young children. And they ended up setting off a bomb inside and there was a tremendous fire and somehow the only people that ended up killed were the people that actually perpetrated the crime but the children all reported that the room was surrounded by angels and they knew that they were going to be all right and it it was pretty amazing you know uh, out of the mouths of babes you know how would they have that even context to to report so just another just another one of those uh, experiences that people have had um now are there uh, i know we're gonna have to take a break in just about another minute and a half but are there the different levels of angels i mean we hear about the archangels that everyone's familiar with and then you're talking about uh angels that have a job to do uh, are there different levels? Yes, there are. There are many, many different types of angels. Um, you know, for instance, the angels of the future, you know, who kind of very gently guide, uh, you know, guide the human population into their next step. Um, yeah, and everybody has guardian angels, of course. Um, so, you know, there's probably more angels on this planet than our people. <laughs> Great. Well, we will talk a little bit more about that uh, when we get back. I'd love to uh, speak a little bit, bit about Guardian Angels and then definitely get into your book series on Rebel Angels and what exactly that means. So we are going to take a quick break and we'll be back in just a couple minutes with author Timothy Wiley. Stay with us. Hello everyone, 
Lorian Fenton here, host of the California MUFON radio show, asking if you'd like special access to exclusive and amazing information about UFOs, the paranormal, and all things unexplained. If you're nodding yes, then join IRN's Insider Club. As an Insider Club member, you'll get an all-access pass to premier Inception Radio Network content for only $4.99 a month. This includes live UFO and paranormal conferences, live streaming UFO sky watches, exclusive IRN radio and TV productions, and of course, paying radio with MJ and Ken Storch. So don't wait any longer. Visit InceptionRadioNetwork.com and click on Member Login to join IRN's Insider Club and get your VIP access today. Are you a fan of Inception Radio Network? Do you reckon it's the best alternative talk radio station on the planet? Well, if you do, head to facebook.com forward slash Inception Radio Network and like the page. Tell your friends, spread the word, and keep listening to the best. Do you have a smartphone? If so, Inception Radio Network is the best app for you. Available on iTunes, Android, Samsung, and most other app stores. Just search Inception Radio Network. With the app, you can listen live, check out podcasts of recent and past shows, view our videos, see what shows are coming up, who the guests are, and, via the chat room, send live questions to those guests. You know it makes sense. Check your app store now. Inception Radio Network. I'll see you there. Hey, IRN listeners, make sure you tune in to Night Vision Radio with Renee Barnett. Renee will be exposing the truth one secret at a time. When? Thursdays. Every Thursday, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. Pacific. Where? Right here on IRN. You're locked into Inception Radio Network, Superior, Wisconsin. back. You're listening to Night Vision Radio. I'm your host, Renee Barnett. We're talking with author Timothy Wiley. Uh, We've been talking about his experiences with angels during the last half hour. Also, his NDE experience, which also encompasses the angel subject. Um, Just a a few more questions. Uh, Well, actually, I'd like to get into your idea about rebel angels. I know you've written a whole series of books on that. Can you explain to us what is a rebel angel? Is that the same thing as a fallen angel? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, I mean, the the disagreement, the angelic rebellion, if you like, uh, that I talked about earlier that happened, um, you know, uh, as I said, 203,000 years ago, uh, pulled a lot of angels along with it. Um, and these became, you know, known as, as the, the rebel angels. Uh, now, what has happened to the rebel angels, of course, is another matter entirely. And that's what the books I've been writing, uh, together with a rebel angel, a discarnate rebel angel that I've been basically um, kind of working with for about 15 or 20 years now. Um, and uh, over the last four or five years, we've been uh, producing these collaborative books. And she's basically telling her story. She came to this planet half a million years ago with one of the first of the interventions. Um, so she has been able to sort of see you know, the whole the whole, <laughs> the whole spectrum of uh, of our sort of um, you know fall from grace, if you like. Uh, because the rebe- when the rebellion hit, uh, most of the angels who took care of this planet actually sided with the rebels. So, you know, we've been, um, you know, one of the really archetypal rebellious planets. And what was the rebellion about? 
It was about um, responsibility and freedom of choice. Um, the, the way the universe is organized is, is pretty rigid. Um, and when you get to the, this level, if you like, where we're just kind of emerging from our kind of animal you know, heritage, uh, the angels who, are in, who take care of us have to be pretty broad-minded, have to be pretty easygoing in a way that most angels aren't. And I think probably, you know, they got the feeling of, well, you know, we could do a lot better if we were on our own. You know, we don't need the centralized command anymore. You know, we're down here. These guys don't know what, what we have to go through. That kind of thing. So it was about... Um, was it a rebellion against the system? Was it a rebellion against God? Um, you know, what are we to think about these rebel angels? Well, it's, it's yeah, what we to think about it is, is a complex thing. Um, I mean, just to <laughs> give away <laughs> give away the basic secret of the books that I'm writing is that what is happening to the rebel angels is that they have been given the opportunity of incarnating as human beings, right? And living out a life on a planet such as this, right? Under the um, auspices of the decisions they'd made so long ago. So they're, given to be, they're being given the chance, if you like, to redeem themselves. And also, in redeeming themselves, they're able to influence, um, you know, uh, the planet's growth in, uh, in spiritual understanding. You know, but it's a long, it's a long situation. I'm sorry, I'm trying to take control of my cat who's now. <laughs> I hear him every now and then. <laughs> I know, I know. He's just a kitten, and he just likes to destroy everything. <laughs> we love our, we love our animals. Oh, we do! My God, we love him so much. I know. Yeah, so um, it's my understanding that um, the rebel angels are coming back and are incarnating as human beings. And it's, I think I heard one angel say uh, that squeezing a, an angel into a human being is like uh, squeezing a rainbow into a Coca-Cola bottle. <laughs> oh. So it takes a lot of incarnations in order to sort of get, get the angels kind of ready to uh, you know, take on a, a human incarnation. Because it's you know it's not easy down here, not easy at all, especially for an angel. And when these angels incarnate, are they aware? No, no, no. Because part of the bargain is you you live your life as a human being. Right? That's what you have to do. But we're getting to a stage now where it actually is more important than they that they wake up to who they are because they can be much of much more value. And the letters I'm getting uh, from people are showing me that by knowing who they are, they come to peace inside themselves with this sort of pressure. Um, because a lot of them, you know, a lot of them feel that feeling that they're, they're here because they did something terribly wrong or terribly bad or something like that. And I mean, that's what got me going. Um, it, it's really when I started realizing, you know, how, how deeply flawed I was. Um, that was what got me sort of interested. And I think that's probably what propels a lot of people into trying to understand who they are and why they're here. It's so it's quite possible that someone listening to this show right now is an angel and doesn't know it. Yes, I, I would imagine there were quite a number of, of, of them because this sort of program and this sort of... Um, realm of interest, you know, uh, draws a lot of them in because, of course, you know, they have sort of a very, you know, ancient sort of memory of, of, of the spiritual life in a way that most people don't have. You know? And if someone is, is having trouble uh, sort of being human, uh, and has a, an idea that there might be something more to it or more to them, what what would one look for in order to come to terms with finding out that you are a, a being, an angelic being? There, there seem to be a certain number of common denominators. One is that um, they tend to have very difficult childhoods. In other words, they have to meet a lot of challenges very young. 
And one of the reasons for this is to strengthen the emotional body, because angels have rather weak emotional bodies, because they don't need the strong emotional bodies, because they don't have um, many choices to face. Uh, we face choices every second of the day. We need our strong emotional bodies. Um, so, generally speaking, rather difficult childhoods, um, they feel very, very different from their friends. They're generally not understood by their parents. Um, often their brothers and sisters don't understand them. Uh, sometimes they they may have an autistic aspect to them. Um, they generally they can go artist, you know, into the art, arts. Um, uh, yeah. Did you say artistic or autistic? Some have an autistic aspect, right? Oh. And then I also said uh, that they're drawn to the arts. Uh, oh, interesting. So both. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, quite, yeah. You see, yes, I mean... And do you feel that they have this autistic aspect uh, because they're not entirely human and... A lot of times when you hear about autism or aspects of it, like Asperger's syndrome, it is sort of the human feelings and the human emotions that are not quite what we would term normal. Yes. Yes, exactly. And you, in the aspect of things, you know, you get the incredible brilliance of certain things. Yes, absolutely. But yes, I mean... I mean, from my own personal thing, I know, for instance, that it took me at least at least 500 lifetimes to get here. Right? And these aren't just lifetimes on this planet, lifetimes on, on a series of other planets as well. So this is a conditioning process necessary to be able to live in this, under these conditions because you see what goes with the freedom of choice and what goes with the emotional um, strength is an incredibly strong emotional, um, uh, emotional mess, if you like. Uh, you know, the astral, for instance, here is really, really a foggy place because there's so much uh, astral thought forms with so many emotionally powered thought forms. Extraterrestrial find it very hard to be down here. I mean, the first ones that came that I know about just after the war could only be here for, for 10 minutes. They could they lasted ten minutes before they had to get out. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, so we say, well, why don't they land on the White House lawn? Well, they did actually, um, but um, it's because it's pretty damn uncomfortable. And, uh, yeah. I hope you don't mind a rather direct question. Okay. Are you a rebel angel? Oh, it is a direct question, isn't it? Uh, yes, I am. <gasps> I knew it. And um, how how did you come to terms with that? How did you, how was that revealed to you? It's been a long process. So uh, was it like a, a slow realization? Well, it started, as I said, it started back when I was in my twenties, with really kind of come, trying to come to terms with um, because. In those days, LSD was legal, right? And um, a lot of us, you know, who were interested in investigating ourselves, um, you know, used LSD. Uh, and the, I think the first four or five trips I took were absolutely hellish. They were terrible. And it was my girlfriend was next to me having the time of her life. So I was, you know, what's going on? You know, why, why would I have these dreadful, dreadful trips? And of course, that. That's what got me interested, um, and then I started realizing how damaged I'd been in the war, and you know, then why did I, why did I choose to be born into a war? You know, <laughs> and once you start asking these questions, you get deeper and deeper and deeper, and you start realizing. And then I think I was in my forties when I started getting uh, an understanding of the angelic rebellion, and then everything started fitting together. And this particular rebel angel that I call Georgia, uh, who's been working with me, I, she tells me now for three or four incarnations. Um, and she was the angel who actually held me when I was under the bombs in the war. I would leave my body, and she would take care of me. I didn't, I didn't know anything about this until many years later. 
but that was my first kind of uh, introduction to angels, if you like. Hmm. Now, this this woman, Georgia, who you say is an angel, uh, a rebel angel, she's an incarnated person. No, no, she, she's... No, she just got, she doesn't have a, a physical body. No, oh, I, I see. see mm. You don't see her, but you are able to communicate with, with her. Yes, she kind of. I feel her standing behind me. You know, um, sometimes she has her hands on my shoulders, um, and you know, she basically generally comes up with the concept. You know, she'll come up with a, a statement, or she'll come up with a sentence, or, or, or um, you know, we'll discuss it a little bit. Um, and then she essentially uses my hands to, to write. I mean, I, I'm not a medium per se. It's more of a discussion. It's like having a friend. But it's taken about, um, it's taken, I think, 15 years to get to a point where we can trust each other enough because it's awful to begin with. I mean, I thought I was going crazy. You know? So you don't, you don't really uh, call your work with her a channeled material because you feel you're just communicating with someone. Yeah, it's more collaboration. It's more, sure. yeah, it's like collaborating with somebody, yeah. I see. Well, that's really interesting. And um, before we get too much further, because we've only got about 15 minutes left in the show, I want to let everyone know how to get your books. Uh, for one thing, you can go to Timothy's website. That's Timothy Wiley, and that's spelled W Y. L L I E dot com, Timothy Wiley dot com. You can also find them on Amazon dot com. I've seen um, when I was looking through the materials today, I saw that they're widely distributed. So, uh, but do have a look at Timothy's website because I would urge you to take a look at his artwork. It's absolutely amazing and gorgeous. So I would uh, definitely recommend you have a look at that. There's some great articles there as well. Uh, I read uh, something really interesting today on uh, NDEs that you wrote, Timothy, and I really appreciate that. Uh, that was very, very well well done. Now, Lorraine in the chat room is asking, Is there are there circumstances in which your angel cannot follow you? Um, mm. Angels tend to turn away uh, from moments of intimacy. Um, but no, I don't think... Um, I mean, put it this way, angels aren't with us all the time, right? We kind of share, we share our angels. Um, and when we need them, they're there, put it that way. Uh, so, you know, we make our choices, we make our decisions. Um, we, don't, we don't make them because they tell us to make them. You know, we make them because they suit us. Uh, and then we have to take the consequences. So, yeah, they're, they're with us with, you know, all the time, basically. Now, you say, you know, they're, we sort of share them, but they're there when we need them. Um, so, in other words, if they're off doing something else, helping someone else or in someone else's uh, area, they still know when we need them. They still know when, when it's time for them to step up and, and show up. Oh, yes. Yes. No, I think, I think, according to Georgia, they live in a kind of different time, time frame than we do. Um, and, I mean, I can give you an example, for instance. When I was um, 17, I, my first car was a Deux Chauveaux, one of those little, little Deux Chauveaux French cars. And I was driving with my girlfriend out in the country, coming down the hill, and another car drove in front of me taken from the right-hand side of the bottom of the hill. And I had to swerve to avoid running straight into the person and killing the person. And our car went over and over and over and smashed, smashed down into like a pancake. And Jenny and I were thrown out. Now, and anyone who knows the Dershaw, though, knows that the windows are about five inches big. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow... Uh, somehow my girlfriend and I were, were thrown out in different directions. You know, I, I came to and I, wheels were still going around. Um, and uh, I had no, I had no, how on earth could we have been gotten out of that car? I had no idea until I was in my 40s or 50s. And I found out that I was actually pulled out 
by a couple of um, what are called midway creatures, uh, a group of angels who live midway between the um, you know, guardian angel level and our level. And they can interact with us. They can get into our reality. Angels basically can't get into our reality. They can get into our imaginations, but they can't get into 3D reality. These midway creatures can get into the 3D reality, and they were the ones who pulled me out. So, yeah. Now, in this angelic hierarchy, uh, the angels are above above humans, right? A level above human, not to uh, use a Marshall Applewhite term, but <laughs> the angels are a, a level above human, or... I, I avoid the idea or, of above... Or are they just different? Yes, different, I think, is much much better way of seeing it. In fact, you know, we have something the angels don't have. The angels aren't indwelt by the God. We are. Mortals are indwelt by the God. That's why the angels serve us. They serve us because we're indwelt by the God. That they, that they all serve, they all love. Uh, so we're very special to them. I mean, you know, we have a terrible low opinion of ourselves. But we are, when we get out there, when we get out of our bodies, we find that we're very highly regarded because we've been able to survive in this incredibly difficult situation, you know. That's amazing. Now, beings, uh, people are, are, are beings on other planets. Do they have the same types of interactions with angelic creatures? Yes, extraterrestrials have angels, too. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the best way of looking at it is to realize that the universe is kind of divided into two enormous sort of uh, uh, frames of reference, if you like. There's the outside world, the external world, you know, uh, of the extraterrestrials and, you know, that we can touch and feel and smell. And then there's the inner world of the angels. Now, the universe is organized from the inner world, right? and facilitated by the outer world, by the denizens of the outer world. So we're, if you like, the hands of the angels. Uh, those are the organizing principles behind the universe. Hmm. And uh, so Lorraine asked another question from the chat room, and she said, uh, if... if um, Angels, let's see, what was the question here? i got to scroll back. Sorry about that. If angels can be reborn as a human, can a demon be reborn as a human? We haven't gotten into demons at all. Are there such things as demons? No, no there are no, no, no such things as demons. Uh, there are such things as thought forms, right? and thought forms can manifest uh, as, as a demonic uh, aspect, but there's... There's no such thing as demons per se, and thought forms are very easy to uh, to get rid of if one um, you know loves them from the heart. If one sends a beam from the heart, one can dissipate a thought form very easily. So no, there are no such things as demons, and demons don't incarnate. You know, mm -hmm. No human demon, nothing like that. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> Those are good. Now, I, you know, we've talked about your uh, series uh, on Rebel Angels that you've written. Now, what is? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your very latest book, and sort of uh, what what that's about? And then we'd like to know what it is that you're up to next. <laughs> uh, well, I've, I've got two streams of books out at the moment. Uh, the Rebel Angel books, um, and the latest one came out about uh, two months ago. It's called Rebel Angels in Exile. Um, and then the book that is being, in that series is going to be coming out next year is uh, called, uh, what's it called? Um, Wisdom of the Watchers, that's right. Mm. There's another one coming out after that. And I've written eight of them. I don't know if the publisher is really going to be patient and generous enough to do the whole eight, but we'll see. They've committed to five so far. And then the other stream is the Heliang's Proposition, which is a book that uh, came to me uh, as a piece of automatic writing in the late 70s. And I decided um, that it was such an interesting story that I illustrated, and uh, which I've done, and... Uh, taking me 30 years, a 30 year book. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Now, there's there's pictures of that book uh, on your website, and I was 
looking yeah. looking at that it, it looks like a beautiful piece it, it looks sort of like something you know you'd want to have in your collection i hope so i hope yeah. so i mean it was a, it was a labor of love i mean i did it because i just absolutely loved loved doing it and you know it's a it's a it's a fable. It's a cosmic fable, if you like, about uh, you know another look at the creation myth, you know, through a different viewpoint. Uh, interesting piece of work. Yeah. yeah, it's it's beautiful, just beautiful. Are you? Is your artwork for sale? Uh, I I I tend not to. Um, I worked out when I was young that if I wanted to be a musician, I better not be. I uh, want to get paid for it, and I have the same sense about my artwork. I consider myself basically a visual artist, you know, who just happened into all this stuff because I got interested in non-human intelligences, you know, in dolphin intelligence and extraterrestrial intelligence. But I'm basically a visual artist. Um, that's what I love to do. You know, I, I, we we didn't ha even have time, you know, to get into your studies of uh, dolphin intelligence, but uh, it was interesting today. I just happened to run across something uh, on someone else's Facebook page. I don't even remember whose page it was, but they had a picture of a human brain next to a dolphin's brain, and the dolphin's brain was like twice as big, at least, as the human brain. And I thought yeah. that was quite interesting. Well, they've managed to exist, you know, for 35 million years, and they haven't destroyed themselves. Uh, and they're highly intelligent. But, you know, they place their intelligence much more in the out-of-the-body realms. Uh, they're much more facile in that area. Um, because water is, you know, water is a great medium for leaving the body, as, as John Lilly discovered. Uh, so they're, they're much more active in the out-of-the-body realms. Hmm. Interesting. And, and were, were you able to spend time with the dolphins? Yes. I, I I was lucky because now it's much more difficult to do it. But I just I just went down to Florida and I I kind of got inducted into a, into a pod. I oh. just went out every day and and, and uh, just basked with them. And uh, you know they put me through a whole series of tests. It was such a fascinating thing because I had a series of questions I wanted to ask them that I had held in my mind, and they had answered all of those questions, you know, over a period of about twelve days, including the question as to, you know, uh, what, how do you relate to extraterrestrials? And on our last uh, last day, night there, uh, there was a, a magnificent display of extraterrestrial craft out. Um, over the bay. And then we got back in New York, another extraterrestrial craft, and then a contact with a little extraterrestrial. So, you know, it was the, the dolphins really got me into it because when I realized dolphins really are intelligent, they really are very, very intelligent, it's, except that we don't, our intelligence isn't matched with theirs. We, we can't perceive their intelligence in a sense. Is it a different type of intelligence? A different type of intelligence, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's going to be the same with extraterrestrials, you know, there's different types of intelligence. Uh, well, I can't wait to uh, see what you come up with next, because uh, you've been a, a very prolific writer and written some really interesting materials and also uh, varied material, which is really, really interesting. You've had a uh, an amazing life so far, and I can't see why it wouldn't continue on to be just as amazing so we'll look to see what what you come up with in the future and i want to thank you so much for coming on with us tonight and i want to thank uh, patricia baker our mutual friend for connecting us because it has been absolutely fascinating well that's sweet of you that's very very kind Thank you so much. Yes, and very good questions. And I really appreciate it, you know, uh, talking intelligently about these matters. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I, I just try to come from the standpoint of, a, you know, the, the average listener and what they might like to, to know about and what their next possible question might be. So, all right, I guess the music's rolling. Timothy, thank you again so much for being on with us. Timothy Wiley, don't forget to go to timothywiley.com, check out the artwork, and check out the books. Take care, everyone, and good night.